Hey, what's up, guys? It's Nick here. We are excited to have Andrew Greenbaum on the podcast this week. Andrew is a fellow friend of mine and SCAD grad. Uh, I got to interview him when I went down to Miami for Design Miami, and SCAD was gracious enough to uh, host the podcast in their media booth. So we had production level video. So you should check that out on YouTube if you have a chance. Um, I think there's a little bit of other background noise going on just because we're at the exhibition, but it's a great episode. So I'm excited for you guys to listen to it. Um, As always, you guys know the deal. Like, give us five stars, subscribe on YouTube, podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all that stuff, you know. Um, If you aren't on the Discord yet, definitely join the Discord because we are going to be chatting and talking about the episode. So we want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, And we always like to thank our promotional partner at Let's Design Daily. They post amazing design work from designers across the world. So check them out if you haven't already. I think other than that, we're good. Let's get to it. Welcome to Minor Details, I'm Nick. I am Andrew Greenbaum. And we are two designers in Miami. Sweating the small stuff. That's right. There we go. Andrew, uh, thanks for coming in today, man. Yeah, thanks um, for having me on your show. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. We are in Miami for Design Miami. This is the SCAD media booth. And mm-hmm. Andrew is a friend and fellow SCAD grad. We have, uh, we went to school together and Andrew has worked for a range of studios, mostly in the furniture and lighting space. Yep. Um, but I'm super excited to also get into some of Andrew's entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, so yeah, I kind of want to start off a little bit, Andrew. Maybe just tell everyone what brought you to Miami. Well, um, my friend Ian Felton, uh, also a SCAD grad who you know, uh, a talented uh, furniture and um, industrial designer. Uh, he plugged me with um, the SCAD team who was looking to fill their booth with some uh, interactive furniture piece. Okay. And so I ended up um, making that happen with really short notice and uh, yeah, here I am. So let's talk a little bit about that piece of furniture because okay. I think it's kind of fun. Oh, thank you. Um, this is a uh, seesaw chair, uh-huh. yes, yeah, and you actually made or you designed this chair back in school because I remember seeing this when we were in school together. Yeah, was this your senior project or? Yeah, this was it was my senior okay. thesis. Um, yeah, so I started uh, basically designing this um, project kind of at the last minute because I was sort of fumbling through the the thesis process like. That's how it always is. Yeah, um, I guess I should just be be honest here. Like the the process of that project sort of started with like a lot of anxiety. I spent um, most of that quarter just sort of like overthinking everything, because um, there's so much like anticipation for yeah. your senior project, right? It's the and big it's, finale. It's the big finale, and like and it's and it's usually like, hey, it's your project. Do whatever you want. And having such a wide brief just makes your brain explode. Yeah, also it's like you get to this point after like four years of college where like every year you're acquiring all the skills and it feels like at the fourth year around the second quarter mark, it's like you really start to become comfortable in the shop right? and like with all the tools and like with all the computer software. And so, like your your range of ability, like really widens. Yeah. Whereas before, you're sort of like all the projects you do are like dictated by your skill set. You're right. like, I can't use the table saw because I don't know how to use or the you, table you saw. You don't know yet. how to weld or do yeah, exactly. Stuff. Yeah. And so, I think like the f- for the thesis, like not only was it like really scary because you just had so much like community pressure to like yeah, make a great project sure. and to impress your class and your professors and then also like it's the last opportunity you're going to get to like basically use all the equipment because usually it's like the last I think what's the class called again 
I think like it's just like pieces. Studio 4 or something. Studio 4, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so it's like really, usually you take that at your your last class. Last, and then, last class, yeah. So there's all this pressure, so. So there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. But you came up with this idea last minute, and was it just something that popped in your mind, or what was the thought process behind this this seesaw chair? Were you looking for some sort of playfulness, or yeah. how did you arrive on this? Well, like, I was really interested in this design book, um, Speculative Design. Okay. Um, and I don't remember, like, the authors of it. We can link to it. Great. Uh, that'd be awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool book, and it just has a ton of this, like, alternative um, design practice in it where like a lot of the designs that are shown in this book are really interactive. Okay. So I was really inspired by that. I was trying to get to that point, but I just didn't know how to do it. And so anyway, long story short, I ended up doing like a couple sketch models, um, really just like uh, Basswood and like Zappagat. Yeah, yeah. And just kind of arrived at the seesaw and just figured like, okay, I really got to do something now because I'm running out of right. time. Right, time. And the seesaw just seemed like a simple motif that everybody would sort of recognize. Um, and it had that sort of interactive bit that I, that I wanted to express, but it wasn't like so far out there that it wasn't like, it just seemed tangible and yeah. like simple and, well, I think and like appropriate. What's so. also really nice about your seesaw chair is that and, and maybe if you're just listening, it's essentially like two chairs, and instead of like a rocking chair, it's the rocking chair leg kind of extends to both chairs, and so you're yeah. you're sitting facing someone. Yeah. Um, and we'll post photos and stuff, but I I like it again, kind of like we said, it's it's this very distilled, almost motif or symbol, and once you look at it, you get the concept right away. Um, so I think it's a really strong idea in that sense. Thanks. So that's awesome. You you. Uh, had SCAD commission you to design one for yeah. their booth here. Yeah, pretty much. That's great. And that's exactly yeah, I works. came down as well for SCAD and doing some live streams and stuff. So that's why we're in Miami and it's beautiful weather out here. It's wonderful weather today. Um, and you're actually based out of LA. I'm, I came from LA, that's, so, right. that's where I live. So you always have nice weather. <laughs> that is true. LA usually has nice weather, although recently it's been quite cloudy and rainy. Oh, okay. But it's kind of nice every once once in a while, like, because LA is like constantly sunny. That like those couple days oh. you get clouds, you're like, it's a little it's break. Like, it's a little break from the sun. Um, it's kind of nice. Andrew, I want to. What we usually do is we kind of get a little of your backstory. Okay. We like to hear how you got into industrial design. Industrial design is a pretty niche field, and not a lot of people know about it. Um, yeah. So I kind of want to hear the aha moment, or was there anything in your childhood that kind of led up to? discovering design or discovering your passion for design? Um, yeah, so the story sort of starts in high school where you know, I was in high school and like none of the work I was doing really like connect, I didn't really connect with any of that. Um, and like, it was art based? Were you doing no, art based? Like, just... it, it, the story really starts at high school in the, in the sense that like I just didn't have a taste for academics. Okay. And uh, I really didn't know what I wanted to do and I my guidance counselor and my mom really pushed me to go to SCAD. Um, and so I, I really leaned on my mom and like trusted her that she like knew um, what the next step for me was at that point because I was really lost and okay. then... Um, was you, I, is your mom a creative professional or...? No, she's, she's just a great mom. Okay, <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> She's just sick. Um, but they, she yeah, obviously but, knew about SCAD, and yeah. I guess your guys' counselor did too, yeah. so they were like, hey, this is a good fit. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Shouts out Allison um, and Miss Avery, uh, my guidance counselor, Miss Avery from Lakefield. Um, so, so yeah, I went to, I went, I showed up at SCAD and sort of toured the school and was just like amazed by the facilities. Yeah. Like that's really what, what caught me. And I think you talked about this on a previous podcast. Yeah. You were saying like, if that moment, if that clicks yeah. in that moment, then you know you right. sort of have like that inkling for it. Um, so I toured Gulfstream, which is the uh, facility that SCAD hosts their industrial design program in. And uh, I think I was just really excited about the opportunity to like gain, a, gain skill sets that allow you to make whatever you want. Right. It just seemed really open-ended and like magical. free and it's magical. Kind of, it's kind of magical in a way. Yeah, it was wonderful. And so 
after high school and I did that SCAD tour, like I decided SCAD was probably going to be a pretty good option for me. It just seemed like a wonderful city. Yeah. The resources seemed awesome. And then I took my first design class, Design 2D. Okay. And um, got a really good, for, like the first design grade I got in college was really, it was like an A. And okay. I was like, I'd never really gotten A's without, not to like, <laughs> without cheating. <laughs> yeah. And I was just, I was like, whoa, like I might actually be good at this. Okay. And then I just gained so much confidence from that first experience. and. Um, I was a little bit like tripped up on industrial design at first. I was telling you this last yeah. night, um, where like I opened up the uh, the brochure for the program and I saw a bunch of like lime green cutting boards, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my All god, those cutting boards. please no, I don't want to do that." <laughs> but then like after like joining the community and like learning about people like Dieter Rams, yeah, and like. <laughs> just folks like that and like how contemporary and interesting all these design solutions can be. I was just like, you're so hooked. So into that. That's awesome. So you studied at SCAD and I believe you had an internship or two. The one that I have written down is you interned at Umbra. Was that during your SCAD? Yeah. Study? Yeah. So in on Christmas breaks, I would go back to Toronto. Okay, so you, did you grow Umbra. up in Toronto? I grew up in Toronto. Okay, so now you're based out of LA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Canadian. So, oh, okay. It's a good fact. Cool. Mm -hmm. And working at, interning at Umbra, like, how did you get into that scene? I mean, if you're Toronto based, was it as simple as like, hey, I, I'm right down the street. Can I intern for you guys? And and maybe tell a little bit about that experience with Umbra. Oh. Um, anything that you learned that was interesting yeah. or so. I got plugged with Umbra because I grew up um, with Gray Rowan, who's the son of Paul Rowan, okay. who is the co-founder of okay. Umbra. And um, he was like a close childhood friend who I didn't really connect with, but our families would go skiing together, like in oh, the small, small hills of Ontario. Okay. And uh, so when he, Paul Rowan, heard that, um, I was doing industrial design, he was like, oh, like, let me, like, tell this kid what's good. And so Paul Rowan sort of, like, hooked me up with a bit of guidance, and then he encouraged me to send a portfolio into Umbra. That's awesome. Okay. Um, which I quasi did. I ended up sending them, this was so silly, like, you know the Clemens Trogler door? It sounds familiar, but I can't. So I can't. the Clemens Trogler door is this um, kinetic door sculpture thing. Is it the one that's like two squares and has, it like yeah. folds in half as it moves? Yeah, like it collapses in yes. on itself, okay. sort I know of. What you're talking about, yeah, yeah. That's it went interesting. Yeah, though. it went viral on like BuzzFeed. Yeah. Yeah. It was like one okay. of those designs. <laughs> You've probably seen it then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, most people have probably seen it. It's, um, it's pretty, it was pretty popular in like 2013, right. 2012, yeah, yeah. I okay. think is when it came out or something like that. Anyway, so I like designed them a Clemens Trogler 3D printed door and I like scanned my foot and like 3D printed my foot and like put it in the door. It was like my foot in the door. Oh my god. And I like sent it to the creative director and I don't I don't I didn't really ever get to talk to him about how ridiculous he thought that idea was. I don't know if I got the internship because I did that and they thought it was creative or cool. Yeah. Or it was because I like knew Paul Rowan and okay. I had it like teed up for me. I see. Um, unconfirmed. That's but funny. I think maybe I think he probably appreciated like the technical aspect of it because the right. door it like actually functioned. It, it was, was a like, functional door. It was That's a functional awesome. door, okay. and but like the foot part was kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know. It was a weird approach to getting an internship, but I guess it sort of worked. So you interned there every winter, you said, like yeah. coming out. Yeah. Every winter? And, and then I, like. Did you have any projects that you worked on that actually went to production, or, or what was kind of the, um, the studio culture there? Like, what did, what did you like? So, like, I was when I got to Umbra, I was I was so unprepared. Like, I was so right. green. I it mean, was crazy. you know, that's how interns are. Yeah, um, and so I was like, my first impression of Umbra was like, wow, this team is like incredibly talented, and 
for good reason. They they were doing amazing work that year, and they still are doing like incredible work. Um, but I was doing mostly like prototyping. So like okay. I did a lot of their scaled models out of foam core. That's fun. And so a couple of those scaled models, like a couple years later, went into production. Some yeah. like um, coat hangers. Um, and some picture frames and stuff like that. Right. So I spent a lot of time in their shop and like a lot of what I was doing was taking their like SolidWorks files and using, um, there's a sheet metal setting which I, which I can't really remember. I think it's called unfold. Yes. And you yeah. can take like 3D objects and unfold them right. and then cut them out of paper and right. turn that into a, okay. into a foam. That's interesting. So that's, I was doing a lot of that. That's also a pretty popular um, prototyping method nowadays. You see a lot of design studios doing kind of the, the fold of paper and film yeah, models. It's a great way to get a sense of scale like, yeah. really quickly. So that was a big thing I learned at Umbra is like they were so specific to scale. Like it was so it's so important to them to have interesting. That's you know, a, yeah, that is a good point. Um, that's awesome. So after Umbra, obviously you finish up your career at SCAD. Mm -hmm. Tell me about kind of that transition from university into the real world, getting that first job in industrial design, kind of how that happened. Um, well, I moved out to LA with no job. Okay. Did you just like LA as a city and you wanted to live there? Yeah, like <sighs> LA is a super attractive city. Um, like the weather is, is obviously beautiful and um, it's a major place for industry and okay. has the ocean, so I was really attracted to that, but um, more so like a lot of my friends moved there. I see. And I just didn't want to deal with moving to a new city and not knowing anybody, because yeah. that's like, it's just, it's just super important to me to like have that community and Definitely. Of friends to like fall back on. And so I moved out there. Um, I followed my SCAD friends, Taylor Manley and Clay Stein out there. and. Uh, um, so I didn't have a job when I got there, and I really wanted to work for MASH Studios. Okay. Like, towards the end of college, I was, like, focusing my portfolio on furniture and lighting. Okay. And they were, like, the perfect studio for me. They just, they did custom furniture, um, and they did really cool, like, custom work. It wasn't, like, it was just, like, I hesitate to say contemporary because that's, like, overplayed, but it was just good work. And, yeah. Uh, so I called their HR girl like every day for a month. <laughs> no, did you really? Yeah, and she blew me off every time. I mean, you call it every day. But <laughs> to the point where I was like, you're not even looking at my portfolio. You're just blowing me off because you're li like you're being lazy, basically. Okay, interesting. And so I like ended up going out there and um, I like walked into the studio. My idea was just like. I'm gonna get this job by force, like one way or another. So I like <laughs> this walked, is determination. Andrew. I walked into the studio, and I like opened the door, and the studio's like open concept, and so like the door, the entrance to the studio is at the front of Nash's um, studio, and it was just like a line of designers who all looked so professional and like. Like they all knew what they were doing. <laughs> that, that was my perspective at the time. I, I kind of froze and like closed the door and like walked out. And wait, then I, wait, so you went to their studio, you opened the door, you my, saw yeah, it. Yeah, my I don't know what my plan was. It was like I was gonna go in there and like scream about my resume and portfolio or like demand that I speak to the creative director and like obviously I show up and I'm like, my instincts, my social instincts <laughs> kick in there and you're like, don't do that. Like that's a horrible idea. Okay. Uh, so I had another horrible idea and I go to the pizza parlor that was like around the street from the studio and I just ordered like three super big pepperoni pizzas and then went to a computer store and had them print my resume and then I like had them deliver the pizzas with my resume. The old pizza resume trick, man. Yeah, the old pizza resume. For people who don't know, <laughs> that's a good one. I love this this trend, Andrew. It's like you're you're going about getting a job in such a different way than normal people would. I yeah, but I it figured, worked. I figured yeah, it worked. I figured that was the way to do it because like everybody's doing it the same way, right? They're all giving their nice resumes that 
from 30 feet away look right. exactly the same. Yeah. Um, and it's like, there's so much talent. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is a small industry, but there are a lot of talented designers looking for good jobs and there's not, it's not, it is, it's not extremely competitive. But it still, it but has quite. Edge. It is quite competitive, For and sure. so you gotta like hustle to figure figure out how you're gonna stand out. So yeah, I sent them this pizza, and then they were all pretty confused by the idea. For sure. And they were like, "Who is this guy?" <laughs> oh, it's the guy that's been calling us every yeah, day. Yeah, and so like the HR manager, I just like sort of like sidestepped her, and like <laughs> uh, I got a call from the creative director, and they were like. Yeah, we'd like to interview you. Yeah. And then I think he just really liked, he liked my portfolio, which was a bit of a surprise because I'd never really shown my portfolio to anybody. Interesting. I just figured like, it's, it's your reference point in college is like your peers, right? Yes. And everybody, yourself included, like you, um, our friend Josh Brown, who's an amazing painter who we were talking about last night, um, Gabby Burton. Yeah. Um, another talented industrial designer, they all had these amazing portfolios. And I was just like, I don't stand out from these guys. Like, these guys are amazing. Like, if this is what the world of portfolios is like, I don't stand a chance. And so I, I was a bit surprised that they liked my portfolio. And uh, I like, was freaking out. They gave me the job. I couldn't believe it. I was like, That's wow. awesome. So, so you worked on uh, a few pieces there, I, I yeah, assume. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk about some of the stuff you worked on? I know that you, I believe you did their front desk, is that correct? Yeah, so um, another design by force, I guess. I just like forced <laughs> them to make that desk. Well, because the first time you walked to the <laughs> studio, you just opened the door and saw everyone there. So yeah. you wanted to have some sort of. <laughs> well, so like, uh, yeah, MASH was, it's a custom furniture right. design um, studio. They did custom furniture for commercial spaces, so mostly like offices. They okay. did reception desks, they did conference tables, and they did uh, um, like workspaces. So I was on the concept team. I helped design like what these, these tables would look like and tried to match the client's design intent in terms of like aesthetic or if they already knew what they wanted. Um, okay. My job was pretty much just a pricing exercise. It was like price out how much this is gonna cost to produce. Interesting. Okay. And so I was doing concepting and quoting essentially. Um, so yeah, I got to work with like some amazing companies um, like Did Facebook, you? Intel, Google. Oh, that's cool. And that was cool, that was really great. Um, so you helped design some of their spaces? I wasn't really designing their spaces. I was designing their they're like conference tables and reception okay. desks and stuff like that. Like, I just kind of want to get a little more grasp. Were you kind of specking out like the surface finish and like the wood and maybe like the legs and kind of designing yeah. that? Yes, yeah, so it was mostly, like the finish was sort of determined by them. It was sort of fluid, right? We would get a ton of different projects and some of them the client wouldn't know. Okay. And so you'd have a lot of um, control of, the, of like the design. Um, but then some of them would have, you know, interior designers sort of guiding uh, the purchaser's decisions. Okay. So like they would say, we want a walnut, it's going to be a matte finish, something right. like that. Okay. And we want like a simple design. And sometimes they would have reference images and it really was just like a pricing exercise. So there wasn't much design involved. I okay. mean, there was like, you got to double check like that their design is feasible and all that. But yeah. So it sort of varied. What do you think like the most valuable thing you kind of took away from that experience was? Um, I think it was just a step in learning like how to operate as a creative in a professional setting. Yeah, because you know I, mean? I mean coming straight out of school you're kind of, you know, all the school projects are kind of like conceptual and for fun. Yeah. Where this was like you're actually getting prices down and yeah, you was, have to get things was, manufactured. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it was a step in in being a professional, really, like you had to get the numbers right. Yeah. If I mispriced anything, it would cost the company money. Right. Okay. Um, now that's a, certainly a good insight for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so, Mash Studio, you worked there for a bit, and then you kind of transitioned to uh, Lucive Decor, yeah. which is a lighting studio. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about kind of that transition and in that part of your career? Um, well, essentially, I was I was just looking to get more experience in lighting. And uh, so I got a job there. I, um, it was pretty cut and dry. And 
Um, you didn't do any crazy things to get the job? No, okay. just simple. You already, you already, had, a, you already had the whole furniture stuff covered, so. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that was pretty much it. That was that transition. Was okay. So simple. pretty pretty nice and clean. Yeah. And so the kind of lighting that you were doing there, I looked on Lucive's, Lucive, correct? Mm -hmm. Lucive's website, and it's, there's some of it's a little bit more decorative, would you say? Yeah, it was like not a lot of it was my aesthetic. Right, like Ma sure. MASH Studio was very simple, clean, modern, yeah. kind of the contemporary yeah, style. Sure. And Lucid has that kind of more, I don't know, maximalist style. I don't know what you want to call it. But, uh, you know, for one example, I was looking on the website, there was a light that had more of like a leaf shaped uh, shade on yeah, it or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like sort of art deco y. Yeah, art deco y. What do you think about that? Like, how did you cope with? Maybe designing stuff that wasn't necessarily in that, in your personal style. Yeah, um, that's a good question. And, I mean, as designers, like that's a skill that we would ha have to have. Is like, hey, you know, sometimes the requirements of a design is maybe not necessarily like the the modern minimal clean design. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, essentially, it was. It, I think like when you design stuff for clients, like it's not always gonna be exactly what you wanna make. Right. But you gotta, like if you enjoy design, you're probably gonna find some aspect of the process that's mm. enjoyable, and yes. so that's sort of like what the name of the game was there. Okay. Um, Lucive was challenging and, and like engaging really because it was a lot of project management um, and a lot of like design engineering, like figuring out how a lot of components Interesting. come together okay. and make a fixture, right? Like the transition from furniture is like, like furniture doesn't have that many components, but something like a chandelier yeah. can have a ton of components. It's yes. like thousands of glass crystals. Okay. And so there was like a lot of math puzzles that were really interesting and fun about it. Interesting. You know, trying okay. to like calculate how many crystals like fit within a like a 30 foot circumference and okay. how, how that density. Um, like changes of, the light. Yeah, like changes the light and and like getting those crystals from vendors and having them shipped to another vendor and having people hang them. And it was just, it was like a lot of coordination, a so lot were of you, like tinkering. Were you doing some of that project management stuff? Were you kind of coordinating? Yeah, some like, of that? yeah, it's coordinating. So that's a, a lot of that. That's a bit of a different kind of task than traditional ID of like sketching yeah. concepts. I mean, I'm sure you're doing some of that too, but. Uh, you know, with the lighting, like it was very little, um, like in comparison to MASH, like MASH was a lot of concepting, a lot of idea generation, like form generation. With the lighting, it was really on the other end of the spectrum where it was like how to, it was like the production of things, the engineering of things. Interesting, okay. So I didn't really get to do a lot of that form exploration. Okay. At Lucive. Um, but I feel like the whole production side of things is a very valuable skill as well. Hell yeah. Hell like, do, yeah. You, do you think that having that experience really helps you kind of move into some more of these entrepreneurial things? Like having that Absolutely. project yeah, management, like management experience? Just the mere, the mere fact that we had overseas vendors um, providing certain components for us. Yeah. Uh, opened my eyes to working overseas. Okay. And then understanding like that you didn't have to have a machine shop or a wood shop in your backyard in order to make products come together. Oh, that's a good, you yeah, know, like you're sure. really dealing with vendors overseas and, yeah. and sort of coordinating people in tif different time zones. And yeah. So um, that's yeah, awesome. That, so that led to the coffin. Right. So yeah, let's get into some of this, uh, some of your more entrepreneurial endeavors like sure. you're you're passionate about design you love to do stuff on the side yeah so definitely. you have your day job and then you go home and you're like oh man I want to make something cool and or I don't know maybe that's yeah not. no that's pretty much how it goes <laughs> I just like wanted I just keep wanting to make stuff so you designed this inflatable coffin yeah and it went viral and I want to hear the story how, how did this idea come about and then you've currently are have it, is it for sale currently? Yeah, you can okay. you can buy it at uh, www.pompomflits.com. Yeah, so check that out. Check it out. Um, so yeah, so let's start off with like, how did that idea come about? Well, 
It's, oh gosh. I feel like every time I tell this story, people are just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, um, okay, so the story starts with my grandfather. He was so psyched on five hour energy. Okay. Because five hour energy was cheap to produce and cheap to ship. Interesting. And he was like obsessed with the owner of five hour energy. He was okay. like, this guy's got it all figured out. Like he, he was obsessed with like the business. The of business five. of so five he, hour energy. So he wasn't like taking Oh five no, no, no. He was okay. not he was not like okay. taking shots of five hour energy. That guy's far too old for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you yeah, so he was obsessed with that the business aspect of it, like how it's structured and how that business like works. And I'd never thought about design in that manner. Okay. Like I never thought about oh, you can make a commercially successful product by thinking about that side of things. Right. You know, I just thought, like, if you make a desirable product... Like, if you make a really beautiful object, yeah, like you'll be a are, millionaire. Yeah, exactly. But it's obviously, like, way more complex than that. Yes. And that's, that was one of the complexities that I, I learned from my grandfather. And, and so I was sort of thinking about that idea in general. And then the idea also of, like, redefining... Um, uh, product categories that haven't like seen the brush brush stroke of design. That is really fascinating. You know what I mean? Well. I, I I think a lot of times designers want to go and work for the big designy place yeah. like Apple, or yeah. they want to go work on the cool tech product, yeah. or maybe on the you know really awesome furniture side. Yeah. But especially on my end, like like understanding what you're saying is there are industries that haven't really been touched. By design at all. Yeah. Pool floats. Yeah. Pool pool everything, honestly. Yeah, like there's a lot of right. nasty pool products out there that just look like yeah. s- like not great. So, so like and, it, and on my side it's like dog toys was the same same way. Yeah, you know, yeah. That stuff and now there's touched. like beautiful dog toys out yeah. there. There there's some awesome pet products that have come out that have really changed the way that yeah. kind of design affects pets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's awesome. So you kind of wanted to change this this industry that hadn't been touched by design. Right, and so so I was thinking about those two ideas, right? Like how do you like design something that's easy to produce and easy to ship? Right. And then I was thinking about like how to redefine product categories. What co- product categories have yet to be redefined? Right. And then I thought about, I don't know why I thought about pool floats. I can't remember the moment that I actually thought about You're it. You're probably but I remember, laying in a pool, right? I no, no, I, I think I was in bed at, okay. or something like that or in the shower. Um, and uh, I like had that idea, and I ran it by Ian. Okay. Um, Ian Felton, who we talked about earlier, uh, the furniture and industrial designer from uh, SCAD, and who lives in New York. And uh, he he really encouraged the idea. He thought it was amazing, and we started like tinkering um, as like partners on okay. the project. Okay. Um, and just shooting around ideas. Yeah, just shooting around ideas, like making lists of names of okay. what the brand could be called. And it was right around the time we were graduating, so we we were sort of doing this, and we couldn't figure out a way to make it manufacturable. Mm. Um, every quote I got was like three thousand dollars, six thousand dollars for a sample, and I just couldn't figure out was how this, I was going to do that. And this was you had already come up with the coffin idea, correct? Um, or you were just trying to get a sample of some design. Yeah, like just a sense of who would even manufacture right. this. So this was at SCAD. Okay. And then uh, and then the idea got kind of got tabled for a while. It was like three years or two or three years that it got tabled. And then um, one night I was just going through Alibaba. Yeah. And looking through like lists of people who make stuff. Those late night Alibaba binges. I, and, yeah. I feel I feel same way. I, I'm on Alibaba. <laughs> it's a great place to find yeah, yeah. vendors. And I was just sort of like looking through products on Alibaba, looking I guess for inspiration or to be productive. That's funny. And I found a inflatables manufacturer, and I thought about that project. I was like, whoa, what if I hit them up? And I hit them up, and they gave me a quote that was reasonable and. Uh, I was sort of, I had a list of uh, floats that I wanted to do, okay. and I don't remember the the time that I actually thought of the pink coffin, but it was on that list. Okay. It was just like it was like I had a Google Docs with like right, some yeah, yeah. <laughs> some ideas, and um, I ran that one by a couple friends, and they thought that was like really sort of interesting and. Uh, 
I thought it would be so shocking and weird. It, it is a really great juxtaposition. Because yeah. Because when you think about pool, you think about like sunshine, you yeah. think about like very happy, like rainbows, and like it's very, it contrasts so well. Yeah. To have a coffin in, floating in your pool, it's like what in the world? This yeah. is crazy. And yeah. I think I think what's also a really key point about that design is that you made it pink, which yeah. like if you made it black or if you made it very much like almost it, the pink actually bridges that gap. Yeah, it makes yeah. the juxtaposition feel right. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, it just seemed obvious yeah. to make it pink. I don't know. I don't know why. It was just like make it as outlandish and outrageous as possible. And so, when you were designing this, did you sketch it up, or did you just have this idea and you sent it to your factory, or how, how was that kind of? Well, I didn't know how. Like how do you make a pool float, right? Yeah. So, you make a pool float by relying on your vendors to make good construction decisions for right. you. Right. Because you're not. You're not making the patterns of these like. No. I guess it's a vinyl, some sort of vinyl it's, sheet. It's a P. It's PVC. PVC sheet. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, you're not making patterns. You're not like specking out exactly how they're going to cut this thing up. Right. So the process really is like. You can't. There are some limitations, right? Like you can't do a perfect square, because a perfect square turns into a bubble. Oh, so you need ribs, and then if you add ribs to a square, it becomes like wavy, like wavy right? OK. Um, so you're sort of thinking about that and what, how that would play out in the design. So you're sort of limited there. And then, um, but yeah, you just, I just drew it, by, drew it by hand and gave them some rough dimensions. And a couple weeks later, I had a sample. And it, I didn't think I didn't think it was gonna go viral. Well, yeah. Um, let's let's talk about the viralness of it. So yeah. you had this sample. Yeah. You take it out with Ian. You guys do some really nice photo shoots of it. Yeah. Well, Ian was in New York at the time. Okay. Um, and it was sort of like unclear at this point if we were gonna make a business out of this. We just thought it was like really it's a cool thing. We just thought it was really funny. Yeah, this and is like the, this is the curse of designers. We just make cool things. Yeah. We just made it and didn't really think it was gonna. I didn't. I think it was going to go viral. I've never had anything go viral before. And, and so um, we made it. We, sh we, we took some photos. And we're sort of like, should we make a Kickstarter for this and like take it seriously? Yeah. Or should we just like post this and like call it a day? <laughs> like, so I think, just I think how it happened is we just, we just posted it. Was it on Instagram? Or where'd you post it? Do you remember? On Instagram. OK. And uh, I posted it. And then I checked my phone and I had more likes than usual. And then I think I went to bed and I woke up and it was just like reposted by Plastic Magazine. And my phone was just getting likes on refresh, which Dang. I've never had. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't get a lot of likes on stuff. <laughs> that one got a lot of likes. And uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. It was, it was really, um, it was weird because I was in panic mode. I didn't know what to do. I was yeah. like, I need to sell this thing, but I don't have anything to sell. So right. then we Kick scrambled our way into a Kickstarter. So you made one. It went viral. And I'm kind of curious to kind of hear your thoughts on maybe how you would do it again. Because it is, it is like tough when something goes viral and you don't have, like you can't capitalize on it, right? Yeah. Like it's like yeah. you, you want to be able to share it with the world. But now you don't, like, how do you? I don't know. I mean, it's weird. It's funny because, like, I don't think, I don't think I could have, like, I, I couldn't have anticipated it. So right. I don't know how I would have done things differently, right? Like, I don't right. think I would have ever been, like, ready to place a gamble on doing a Kickstarter and, like, doing all the video work that I'm super unfamiliar right. with. Like, I just, I sort of end up just doing the stuff that comes sort of naturally and, like, Placing my, like placing the chips on a Kickstarter would have been right. super weird. So, but you did one after. I did one after, yeah, and that didn't work out um, because we were just scrambling. We yeah. didn't have any time to prepare. We asked for way too much money, um, and I think that like was a lesson in ego too. Like we just were like completely overwhelmed by the reaction. So. We, it was a lesson in ego, but then we also didn't want to have like money troubles. Like we both had 
full-time jobs. Right. This was something that like we were doing on the side. And like my theory was like, the way I sort of rationalized it was like, okay, I either ask for a lot of money and it works and great, and then I don't have um, like budgeting, right? Like extremely stressful budgeting yeah, issues or you, for or running. Yeah, you don't want to lose money. Lo yeah, like yeah, for yeah. running your very first business. Right. Yeah. Or, um, and it, and then the flip side is like it doesn't work at all, and I can wipe my hands clean of it right. and get back to what I should really be concentrating on is my full time job. Right. Right. Or I could ask for what we needed to actually make the thing happen, which was like, like just skimming it, like bare bones, like right. just get by. And that would be pretty stressful, right? And right. that would be really stressful. Yeah. I mean, so I guess to sort of go back to your other question, in hindsight, I probably should have had a happy medium. Yeah. Where like I didn't ask for an absurd amount of money, but I didn't ask to go like bare bones. Yeah. But I, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was running the first business that I ever ran, ran and uh, it ultimately worked out, though. Yeah, because now you have, I assume, a stock of of a certain amount, and yeah. you've sold some. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I don't know how much you want to dive into some of that stuff that you've already. Yeah, like, sure. I mean, so basically, uh, the story sort of goes like the Kickstarter failed because I think we asked for too much money. Yeah, and then. Um, a couple months later, my friend from Toronto hit me up and he was basically like, yo, I think this is a really good idea. Um, I want to invest in this project. So I was like, great. Um, it was sort of a second chance at uh, like bringing this thing to life because I was sort of at a point where I was like making samples, like telling my vendor like basically send me another sample and ordering a sample for an absurd amount of money and then selling like one-offs to like people who really, really wanted it. I see, okay. And so he sort of caught wind of that and I guess gained a bit of confidence in the project and then he ended up investing some money into it and we made uh, like a couple hundred of them. Okay. And so they're available on our, on our website to buy. Um, we made a pink version and a black version. Um, and yeah, you can buy them at pompomfloats.com. I do have a question. That hurdle of buying a sample versus buying a couple hundred, mm. the why why is there such a high MOQ for something that, from my end, seems like it's a cut and sew project? Yeah, so they actually make it with molds. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, so so they mold the the fabric itself. They cut the fabric, and then I think what they do. I haven't visited the factory, okay. and it's hard to kind of breach that yeah. communication barrier because my vendor doesn't speak English very well. Right. Um, well enough to like communicate on basic stuff, but hard to sort of dive into like technicalities of how machinery works. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think how it works though is they have this mold that basically gets heated up, and that's what heat welds the seams between the plastic. Got it. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. So you do need to have that high quantity in order to make a mold that exactly. can seam. Okay. Exactly. Instead of hand seaming each one. Right, which is what my assumption of how right. those inflatables were made. I thought they were all made with that machine that sort of looks like, like a, a sewing machine. Yeah, yes. exactly. Okay. Uh, interesting. Now that's that's something that I never thought about. Um, yeah, that's kind of cool. That's awesome, Andrew. Are you working on any new floats or do you have a future for Pom Pom? Is it more of the just kind of marketing business side of things? Yeah, right now it's just like about marketing the product. Okay. And uh, we developed some other floats. We did a giant paper clip. Oh, that's fine. But that needs a lot of like research and development. Okay. And um, I'm not devoting as much time to it as I wish I could because I just started a new job, which I guess we'll probably end up talking about. Yeah. And so um, at the moment it's just sort of like a marketing exercise and it just sort of like cruises along and we get a couple sales a week and uh, yeah, it works out. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I've done a little bit of that as well. Like, in my, you know, my other co-host James yeah. has also, you know, we're I'll call it, designers kind of love this space, or we're trying to kind of encroach on this space of designing and producing yeah. some of our own products, which yeah. I think is a really interesting kind of arena that yeah. hasn't really been accessible in the past. You know, no, now we have Alibaba yeah. and yeah, you can, exactly. you know, get samples and. It's crazy what you can do on the internet nowadays. Yeah, the internet really opens up a ton of opportunity to like make independent designers um, 
lives in terms of making products like so much easier. Yeah. Um, you know, so. Andrew, let's talk a little bit about your latest your latest job. So you're working at a new studio now. I'm working at a new studio. Yeah, it's called uh, ACLA. Okay. They're uh, a in small industrial design studio in uh, El Segundo. Okay. It's right by LAX, and uh, their focus is on uh, aerospace interiors. Oh, okay. So, so a little bit. It's kind of similar. I mean, it's still on the furniture lighting space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Would you say that that like furniture and lighting is your passion, or would you ever want to do something in more of the consumer product space? I would love to move into consumer products. Okay. Yeah, that's not, it seems like a really, it's sort of a neglected portion of my uh, career at this point, and by not really choice, it's just sort of like things have sort of escalated with furniture and lighting. Right. I actually think it's funny, we were talking a little bit about this last night, mm -hmm. but we're here at Design Miami, yeah. and there's a lot of amazing furniture, a lot of amazing lighting. So much amazing work. And oh my God. Well, you were like, I wish there was like an amazing toaster. Or like yeah. an ama you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing vacuum. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, like, so should we just talk about what yeah. we talked about last night? Yeah, yeah. To just reiterate, I suppose? Okay, so like my beef is that furniture and lighting designer, like industrial designers tend to, it seems like they tend to lean towards furniture and lighting to have that sort of creative freedom in products. Right, because right? especially in this kind of art design space, it's almost as if furniture isn't really like, it's not a Herman Miller, it's like an art piece yeah. through the guise of a chair. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It be, it's becoming, it's the canvas to express like all the crazy ways you can use material and right. technique to create a product. Right. And that is, that's like the sickest thing ever. That's what we love about design, right? right. That exploration of material and form and, and construction and manipulating that stuff. So it's just, it's just sort of baffling to me that like no one's done it with like consumer products like toasters. Like why isn't, like we see like out here there's so many crazy like ceramic, like organic right. textured lights that are like insane looking. They're like... And nobody's done that with a toaster. Like, why can't we have like a giant ceramic toaster with all this texture on it that doesn't even look like a toaster, but it is a toaster? I love that thought. I yeah, think that'd I, be sick. I, I think that's a funny we observation. We should do that. Maybe we should collab on that. Yeah, we can do that right now. Sick. We'll figure it out. Um, no, that's cool, Andrew. Um, I also want to just kind of wrap up and get some of your like future plans. Do you have any new projects you're working on? I know that you also kind of along the entrepreneurial vein, have done a piece of furniture on your own mm -hmm. through a company called About Now that you, yeah. or a brand that you've kind of formed. Yeah, so I was trying to start this brand called About Now and my thought was like, how can I do affordable furniture um, in, in manufacture overseas and like... Uh, was this project before or after the floats? That was before. Oh, that so was, the, so that the was about now chair was actually before the floats. Yeah, okay. and so I made the chair, and then just sort of got distracted and started making floats. Okay, <laughs> it just sort of died after that. Like I would love to make more of them. My, I'm hoping it sort of turns into the same thing where it's like that project is sort of tabled for a bit. Okay, and then I'll, and then I'll bring it back. Yeah, I'll revisit it. I will when, say, when the I, time is appropriate. I do really like the design of the chair. It's, oh, thank it's, you. Uh, I, mean, I guess you have a white one too, it's, but it's a black metal frame. Yeah. And then it has a mesh, like a wire mesh to it. Yeah. Super simple. You call it the easy chair. Yeah. I assume it's easy to assemble, or is um, it just a no, easy it was, form? No, it was. I called it the easy chair because it was the exact opposite of easy to make. Okay. <laughs> it was just like, I just worked so hard on that form exploration. I spent so much time making that chair, and then also like, I sacrificed a lot of my life to like my personal life to okay. buy a computer that allowed me to run SolidWorks oh, to wow. make that chair. It <laughs> was funny. just opposite. It's kind of like an inside it was, just, it was actually should be called nightmare chair. Got it. Got it. So. Um, Andrew, I'll, we always like to ask kind of one ending question to our guests. Sure. And I'm just curious, what are you excited about in terms of the design industry in general, or maybe in your own personal life, but like in the future, like there's so many cool technologies and things going on. What excites you? Oh, I'm gonna give the most cliche okay. <laughs> answer of all time. I'm psyched on Cybertruck. Cybertruck. I want to see Cybertruck 
all over the street. At first, I was like, I think what I, okay, so to back up a bit, what I like about Cybertruck is it's like, you know when you hear a song and you're like, what the hell was that? That was the worst song ever. And then it grows on you and you're like, this is the, this yes. is the best song ever. Yes. That's exactly my experience with Cybertruck. I looked at it, I was like, this honestly looks like an ID project that was done in like second year with some foam core. Right. And like, like SolidWorks like filleting for, uh, was like crashing the, <laughs> crashing the program and they just like gave up on filleting it. And then, oh man. Uh, so yeah, I'm psyched on Cybertruck. I don't know, like I was, I really didn't like the look of it when I first saw it. I think because my experience was like, that's a design language that you acquire very early on in your yeah. design career. Like yeah. making things like pointy and right. like flat surfaced, sort of like, I don't know if you'd describe it as like a military aesthetic. Yeah. So or it like has it, like that stealth bomber aesthetic. Stealth bomber, or I was thinking like gamer. It has yeah. that gamer aesthetic. Yeah. I so that was my personal reaction. Was like I was just like this was this like this design team spent two seconds like right. doing this. And then I was also like a bit offended that they had just moved so far away from what was a beautiful aesthetic in their in their Model X. Yeah. And, and their other models. How do you feel that the Cybertruck will affect either the design industry in general or maybe even your designs. I mean, it's not, it, um, in my opinion, it's not necessarily the, the actual angular forms that is gonna affect industries, but I think it's just the fact that Elon has kind of broken a paradigm, and I hope to see yeah, that in other industries. Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm psyched on yeah. now, is he broke that mold of what was considered good car design, yeah. and everybody's like, it's also like a genius marketing play. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but like everybody's talking about Cybertruck. Everybody knows what that is. That's true. Um, That's awesome, Andrew. Um, and, yeah. I do want. I do want to say, uh, do you have kind of an Instagram or something you want to promote? Obviously, pom pom floats. Yeah, pom pom floats. And that's at pom pom floats on Instagram. At pom pom floats. What about just your personal endeavors? Is there a place people can find your work? Or? You can follow me at Andrew underscore Green Bum. B U M, which is not actually how you spell my last name. It's just a silly Instagram handle. So, we'll link to everything in the description too. Yeah. So, um, Andrew, thanks again for being on the podcast. Thanks so much, Nick. And uh, as always, I'm at Nick B Baker. Peace.